My name is Kara Boss and I am a Korean American adoptee. I was adopted to America, let's say, uh, when I was around four years old and I currently live in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I have uh, a Dutch husband, that's how I ended up here, and two children, uh, a boy and a girl, and I've been living here now for 14 years. So I actually have Dutch citizenship as well. This is What Next, the Adoptee Rights Podcast. I'm Gregory Luce, an Adoptee Rights lawyer and the executive director of Adoptees United. I'm also an adopted person, born and adopted in the District of Columbia. Each episode of What Next is about adoptee rights, whether we have them, demand them, or have already secured them. I talk with a wide range of adopted people, as well as our friends and allies about issues that impact us all. In this episode, C.S. Wright and I talk with Kara Boss, a Korean-born U.S. transnational adoptee who now lives with her family in Amsterdam. Our conversation is part of a recent event featuring issues around dual citizenship for transnational adopted people. You can watch the recording of that event on our YouTube channel, and there is a link to that in the show notes. Because of the time difference between the U.S. and Amsterdam, our interview with Kara was done separately from the event. It sounds like you are definitely an expert on <laughs> like dual citizenship dealing with three different well, countries. I don't well. know about that. I, I can't don't know. I mean, expert, you... but I've definitely gone through a couple processes now. Then when did you start thinking about pursuing Korean citizenship or whatever you could find to secure a better connection to the country? Yeah, I I actually have never been interested in getting Korean citizenship or nationality because I I mean, I never have planned uh, at this phase in my life to live there or to move there or to have a reason, even the F4 visa, which adoptees were also allowed in uh, Korea. I never thought to get that as well because I had no intentions of ever moving there and living there um, because I'm, you know, pretty well planted here in Amsterdam with my children and they're going to school and, you know, we have a pretty good life here. Um, But as a result of the, yeah, all the, yeah, tumultuous times I went through with the lawsuit and with my father's family and uh, everything that resulted uh, after my meeting with him as well. It kind of actually, yeah, I don't know. It gave me some kind of feeling because I've heard of other adoptees, you know, mentioning it before that they wanted to kind of reclaim their citizenship, something that was taken back from them. So it was very symbolic to them. But for me, since I already had dual citizenship with a, you know, a European Union passport and an American, like those are the two most kind of powerful passports you could think of in the world. So there wasn't really any uh, added value in my my mind, at least at that point, uh, to get also Korean citizenship. But I think through the lawsuit and the recognition that I received through my father and all the difficulty that I went through to get that, it kind of gave me this empowerment to where I realized that this was more significant than I had realized. And I think that that's just a part of the emotional journey you go through as you're, you know, just trying to search for your identity and your roots, uh, that you don't recognize some of these feelings at certain points, right, in your life. And especially if you're not at those pinnacle points. And once I like was recognized as being his daughter then it was it felt I felt empowered because then I finally took back something that was taken away from me from when I was a child and also throughout you know all the begging and pleading and everything that adoptees do in order to just get scraps of information and paperwork um, it's very demoralizing as a person and as a human being and so in those moments too like I think it was kind of like this feeling of wanting to fight back and um, when I won the lawsuit, and that was kind of like a byproduct as well, because obviously, since he was a Korean man outside of being an adoptee, because he was a Korean man and I was considered his daughter, then I was allowed to apply for citizenship as well outside of uh, adoptee, you know, rules and uh, allowances. So for me, I think it was more related to that, the fact that I could reclaim what he never gave me and should have given me. And that's kind of, I think, what pushed me. And as well, because of COVID, it, it kind of uh, relaxed a lot of the rules that were in place in order to get citizenship. Because before you had to visit Korea multiple times, you had to stay there for a length of time in order to get certain steps uh, finished in the process. And after COVID hit, they relaxed all of those rules to where you could just apply at the consulate here in the Netherlands. And the only rule that was kind of left is that you had to go within a year of finalizing like the last pledge in your nationality 
uh, you had to go there to finalize like your last four digits of your social security number is similar to uh, what they're requesting. And once I did that, then I could apply for an, a passport and then I would officially be recognized as a Korean national. Um, so that was like the only step that I had to take. And so because of the relaxation of those rules, it gave me more of a another uh, option where I thought, okay, now I'm going to try it and go for it. I think a lot of people don't know about your lawsuit. Could you talk a little bit about that and what you accomplished through that? Yes, I was in search for my mother, my biological mother. And as most adoptees, we don't have any kind of you know information in our files. And, uh, and I'd been to Korea multiple times at that point. And every single time I had visited my orphanage or a Holt, uh, there would be you know a new small little piece of paper that would kind of come to the surface that they were like, oh, we didn't realize, you know, that this was in your file. And so that I was almost domestically adopted. Um, some of the details of how I was found uh, kind of changed. I realized that my date of birth or what I've been celebrating as my birthday was actually the day that I was found supposedly in this parking lot, which I guess in retrospect, most adoptees have this as their kind of, you know, birthday. Um, and so, during this whole search process, I ended up coming to like a dead end. Uh, I couldn't find anything. My parents were unknown. And so then I, re I resorted to DNA, which a lot of people do. And so I pretty much uploaded my DNA into every data bank there is. And I ended up with a match uh, after, let's say, I think I started in 2000. And my daughter was two at the time. So that was 2017 is when I uh, initially started my search. And then in 2019 is when I actually received a DNA match. So it was quite a, a some time later. And it ended up, long story short, it ended up being my uh, father's grandson who had done the test. Uh, he was studying at a university in, uh, in England and happened to do the test just for fun with a roommate. And uh, through him, I was able to make kind of the connections. He was very conservative and very uh, protective of his family. So I didn't get names. Um, I only got maybe a last name or a university that was studied at or different professions. And then through just kind of investigative uh, detective work myself, a lot of Internet, a lot of searching, I managed to find out, you know, that his grandfather was probably my father. Uh, but the family completely stonewalled me, wouldn't talk to me. They said that they spoke to my father, but they didn't. And uh, they basically just tried to push me away and ignore me and make me just move on. And. I think we as adoptees most often, you know, we try to respect a lot of times, obviously, the culture and the place of origin and also our, our birth families. But I think at this point, because I didn't hear it from the source, I didn't hear it from my father saying, like, I don't want anything to do with you. Um, I couldn't accept it because then I, said, I, I kept thinking, what if? What if it's just them and not him? And um, so I wanted to hear it from him. If he said it, you know, and the only thing I wanted, I didn't even want a relationship. I just wanted, you know, a conversation just to know who my mother was. Then, um, yeah, I would have accepted it if, if he would have said that to me. But that never happened. And so then via via, I managed to find uh, a lawyer and, and the idea even that I could possibly file a paternity suit. And uh, my lawyer was willing to take my case and... I mean, in a lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, scenarios, most people didn't think it'd be possible to, to win because, you know, with adoption, your adoption is severed, your relationship is severed, there is no, you know, mother or father uh, left in Korea. And so the family court, though, they just literally took it as it is. So with the evidence that I had, and the different messaging systems where they all, you know, kind of said that he's potentially your father, then they forced him to take a DNA test. And in the end, it was positive. And so the judge declared me as his daughter and that he had to recognize me and take me into his family registration in Korea. And um, and then the byproducts were that, that I was obviously able to claim citizenship and also inheritance. So you would then, for people who don't know, in Korea, there's these family registries and even adoptees are assigned a particular family, yes. but you must have two. Or does the first or does the second one supersede the first one? Well, I mean, I I don't think I at least I don't know, but it has happened before that adoptees have, were still on their family register in Korea and then they were adopted out and they were never taken off. 
Um, but I don't know if I was ever on one, but at least the one I had was made from Holt. So it was just an orphan registry, they call that, in order to make you an orphan so that you can be adopted abroad. Apparently, I still had a form of Korean nationality that was never expunged completely on the Korean side. Uh, so when I was going through this process of being taken up into his registry, they had to basically expunge again my Korean nationality in order to make me really officially like that I was adopted and sent out of the country and then re-officially put me into his registry. And then they didn't know what name to give me. Uh, so that took a really long process as well. And in the end, they gave me his last name with my uh, American name. So they, in Korea, on my passport, it says Oh Kara. Interesting. So I have a completely different identity in Korea in that register. <laughs> and do you now have a Korean passport? I, I think when we talked or traded emails, maybe a, a couple months ago, you weren't finally done with this process, but are you at this point? Well, that was also another uh, surprise is because I was trying to make the appointments in Korea because that's what I'd last been told uh, when I did this a year ago or more than a year and a half ago. They told me I had to go to Korea to finish the process. And apparently six months ago, because I called the embassy just this last week because I couldn't get an appointment in Korea with immigration. And then they're like, oh, no, six months ago, we changed the rules and you can actually apply for the passport here. And those last four digits of your social security number, then you just get those in Korea, but you don't essentially need them unless you're going to, you know, work and live there. So I was like, what? Um, so I had an emergency passport because last year when I was supposed to go, I had broken my ankle right beforehand, so I couldn't travel. Um, and then I got an emergency passport in order to extend the year period. Because if you didn't finish out the nationality within the year of your pledge of basically saying that I won't use an American passport or any other form of identity when I'm in Korea, I will abide by Korean laws and et cetera. And um, once you make that pledge, you have to finalize it within a year. And so the emergency passport extended that year until this year. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, I was trying to make the appointment with immigration and then it was impossible because you have to have an ID number in order to make an appointment. And if you live overseas, obviously, and I don't have that. And if you live overseas, you're also not allowed to make an appointment. So it was a big mess. And so then they changed the rules again. So now we can apply for a Korean passport. So now I'm just waiting for it to be shipped basically back to the Netherlands from Korea. So within two weeks, I should actually receive my Korean passport. That just sounds so complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, was the attorney helping you with this or the attorney really was about the paternity? No, the attorney just helped with the paternity suit and getting me into the family registry. Uh, those legal aspects, she definitely helped me with. But for the Korean passport side, that was all my uh, my efforts. And then also the help of other adoptees and different people who have already gone through the process as well, who kind of could help with different things. But like I said, again, like these kind of things change and then you're not always informed. And so then, you know, and then I informed another adoptee about like, hey, like you wrote this, you know, document and it gave all the steps of what you should do with the, you know, getting your Korean citizenship. And then that was still the old rules. And so that's what I thought it was. And then when I messaged her, I was like, hey, they changed the rules. She's like, yeah, I know. I, I, I got my passport last month. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I wish you would have known that. Right. Well, unfortunately, that's also the issue, right, is all this information is not like bundled in one spot that every, you know, kind of Korean adoptee at least could go to like this one website. That's kind of what you would hope. And they like, this is what you have to do and make it very simple. It still remains complicated. It was interesting to hear that when you're in Korea, you must represent yourself as Korean, um, at least legally. Mm -hmm. Is that unusual? Or do you know? I don't know. I just know that that's the rules to, uh, yeah, you're not allowed to be like, I cannot use an American passport anymore in South Korea, for oh. example. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you essentially, when you get your Korean passport, you'll have three. Yes. That's, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I bet, you know, I bet 20 years ago, you wouldn't have imagined the same thing. No, definitely not. No, but it, it's really just that feeling of taking back what was lost. And yeah, it's really, for, for me, at least it's very symbolic. I know for others, maybe it really is so they can live and work there. And it's fantastic that it's possible, you know, because there's a lot of countries where it's not even possible to do this. So in that re respect, Korea is, you know, a bit more advanced for adoptees, even though it's a very messed up system still, and it's very complicated and confusing. It's still at least possible where I know in a lot of other origin countries, it's not. Right. 
CS, do you have any thoughts on, I mean, would you want to go through this? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because <clears throat> I really love that you're, you're talking about the fact that, you know, you had to do so much of this on your own, the sort of the passport side, because I feel like I, I, I feel like a, a lot of people don't understand just the, the amount of labor in our country adoptees put into filling out paperwork, understanding just the paperwork on their own, because it's so expensive the other route, right, to get an attorney and to get somebody to help you. And so we and we literally become <clears throat> sort of like little mini immigration officers for ourselves, <laughs> you know, working the system. So it's really interesting to hear you go through that. And I, I hadn't heard that they had changed the rules because that was something that I was, I had looked at a little bit about the passport thing. And I was like, oh man, I don't know. The commitment to like, have to go to the country and like have to fill that out. That's like it's a lot, <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. I've sort of cut it off. But um, it's really interesting to hear those updates because that kind of, I don't know, maybe I'll do it. That sounds like something that could be interesting. So, Yeah, and, and the other thing you have to know is that you have to have a Korean translator to, I mean, it, they don't, mm -hmm. I mean, at least from what I know is I, I used to be a Korean teacher. She was wonderful and helped me out where I know other adoptees have actually hired a Korean translator and they had to pay for like per word and it's very expensive then. So yeah. it, it depends. And, and someone was told that they had to have an official Korean translator, which my Korean teacher passed for being an official as long as she like shared her identity. So that could be also a rule that changed that I don't know about. Um, but I know when I applied, at least it wasn't necessary to be like this official, you know, having some kind of maybe, or maybe she has this certificate that you need. I don't know. But um, and then if you don't do it within that year, like this one adoptee, I know she like had to do the whole process all over again. And yeah that's really killing and brutal because I also had the problem because you have to have um, an FBI background check done as a part of the process as well and your fingerprints and so and they have to be valid within I think it's like less than six months in order to apply as well but the FBI were like super uh, delayed in getting any of the, the background checks back to people at this point when I was doing it and so I literally made it within like less than a week of the time and I had to have my sister like you know FedEx it from and it cost like over 200 euros in order to get it FedEx to me on time in order to take it to the embassy here so these are extra costs which of course I didn't expect or you yeah. know yeah so those are things as well that yeah I mean I, I, I definitely can feel that I mean I went through that process even here in America I was trying to get a passport through the um I had to get a new certificate of citizenship we lost the one that I'd gotten and so I kept delaying and at the United States passport office, you can delay it for like six months or something. But after you delayed it after six months, I'd already paid all the fees and everything to get it going. They're like, okay, that's the process all over again. And it was like, oh my God, you know, and that whole thing was, I mean, you just lose tons of money yeah. and time and expense. Yeah. So, yeah. so you had to get a FBI, a, a U.S. FBI background check and then provide that to Korea. Yeah. So, um, even though I'm a Dutch citizen, like, and I did it through my Dutch passport as well, but because I'm also American, I had to have also my American FBI background check as well. So I had to send both a Dutch background check and also a, a U.S. one. So that and was did, a bit more complicated. And did those have to be translated as well into Korean? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Maybe, but I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, for, for U.S. immigration law, the intercountry adoptees, all of their documents in their children have to be translated and it costs a fortune. It's a similar system where they're charging, they have to be official translators and they charge by the, you know, by the content, usually by the word. Yeah. And it's extremely expensive. Yeah. And luckily when we have, when I have a case, for instance, involving an country adoptee, it's already been translated when they enter the country. So I don't have to do it again, but it is one of those costs that are not often realized. And it sounds like that's the same with Korea. Yeah, definitely for the main documentation that was necessary. And I think the Dutch and the American FBI background check, I think English is one language that they, that they do accept uh, for these kind of official documents. But they also had, I think, like, you know, you know how in some marriage certificates as well, then they have like 20 different, you know, the most official languages, they have them also as uh, on the back. And I can't remember if that was the case with these two documents, or it was just because it was English that it was a it was a accepted language then from the Korean government. Are you, so this is an odd question, but are your kids old enough to understand what you're doing? I don't think with the Korean citizenship, no. I yeah. mean, they they understood a bit. Uh, I mean, they're nine and, and 11, almost 12 now. Uh, obviously, this happened back in 2020, the whole lawsuit and everything. So then, you know, it's, it's four years ago now. 
So, yeah, I think that was a bit harder for them to understand. I think the worst part for them was the fact that I was gone. Like I was uh-huh. gone quite often and that was really, uh, yeah, difficult. Yeah. Especially for my Right. But obviously it really impacts them as well to have a mom who is a triple citizen and whether that allows them to acquire that citizenship, I guess is country by country. But I think that's such a yeah. thing we often overlook is especially as adoptees, we forget that this is impacting our kids. Our adoption status is impacting our kids. Yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Those are definitely things I've been confronted with. I went recently to a, a the first Dutch uh, adoptee con- conference here in the Netherlands. And uh, that was one of actually the topics was the second generation from adoptees and how their kids have been impacted. And especially some of the older Korean adoptees who, who now have children, you know, anywhere from 30 or 40 years old, even, and uh, or 20 to 30 years old and how that's affected them. Even when you think, you know, that you're kind of trying to, you're the generational stop, you hope of the trauma exactly. because you're confronting it. You're, you know, you're doing something about it. And you're not just ignoring it or burying it, um, but you can still see some of the obviously after effects of, of what trauma, yeah, how it continues in the family line. Um, they say something about seven generations. I think that trauma is uh, in the you know in in the body uh, and passed on. But uh, yeah, I hope that it's very minimal to mine. <laughs> right. You mentioned there's, I'm not sure if there is a difference. Is there a difference between getting a Korean passport and securing Korean citizenship? Or does one depend on the other? Um, Yeah, one depends on the other because if you don't have obviously the Korean nationality, then you can't apply for the passport to to claim citizenship then, I guess. Uh, So yeah, as far as I know, that's kind of how it works yeah but. and the i guess the reason why i asked it sounded so complicated in your case to establish paternity i'm wondering what korean adoptees have for proof of family registry that would allow them to claim korean citizenship yeah, that was gonna be that was gonna be my question because like for me i don't have as far as i know i don't i don't know that i have i mean i'm sure somewhere but i've done a lot of the digging and the trying to figure out connecting and nothing has come up. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious what that looks like for adoptees that haven't really found a connection when they're doing their search, I guess. Yeah, they changed the rules in Korea for adoptees that you can do it. You just have to basically prove that you've been adopted. You have like your adoption certificate uh, through whole or whichever agency you were adopted through. And if you prove that you're an an adoptee, then you also have a right to uh, claim. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a law that they changed uh, for Korean adoptees. And then you're also not, uh, you don't have to do military service. I think there's like a couple hours or something online or something maybe that men have to do. Mm-hmm. So oh, that, interesting. Is to be, that is something to be aware of, um, but you don't actually, but that's, and, and whether or not our kids as adoptees can have Korean citizenship, that's also something that's unknown still as far as I know. Um, but like, I would never pass the Korean passport onto my son, for example, because I would never want him to be in the, in the military there, obviously, uh, or have, you know, any of those kind of, uh, yeah, effects that, of the Korean nationality. Yeah. That was one of the questions I had because I've heard that about the requirement for military service. And it sounds like maybe they've relaxed that for adoptees if they have to just do something online or, or, or yeah, maybe, that's maybe they're too from- old or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's what, mainly what I've uh, understood, but I haven't heard of uh, Korean adoptees being able to pass that citizenship on to their children, at least, um, as far as I know. I don't think that they obviously took that into account either, right? And this is all kind of like they're learning as they're going, as people are, you know, standing up and trying to speak out for adoptee rights. So that could be something that would eventually also be in place, given the fact also that Korea is like, you know, their population is diminishing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So since you're both immigration officers, um, because of <laughs> you, uh, so what, what's your understanding of the difference between what you've done and getting just an F4 visa, which I've heard of in Korea as well? Yeah, the F4 visa, you're still obviously you're not a you're not a Korean citizen, you're not a Korean national. So you have kind of all the luxuries of still being a, a foreigner. So there's there's different advantages for foreigners, I think tax related and also uh, regarding, you know, I don't know, probably 
discounted phones or this or that, you know, for foreigners um, or visitors or tourists. But uh, if you're a Korean, if you if you're a Korean national like I am, then you can't claim those. Like also like tax rebates and those kind of things for like um, if you shop there, you don't get like the tax refunds back. Uh, those kind of things. And then, but you then you can still work and live there, open bank accounts, even. The one thing I don't know for sure is buying property. Like if 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 you have an F four visa, I'm not absolutely certain that you're you can buy buy property compared to if you're a citizen. I know for sure like I can, as a Korean citizen as well. That makes the whole process a lot easier. Uh, but if you have an F four visa, I'm not sure if that right is extended or not. Yeah, I'll try to look into that. So maybe we have an answer. It's just really interesting that you've gone through that that process, especially several times. It sounds like you know. <laughs> so. I'm really glad that they're opening up more to adoptees, but honestly, especially with everything that's coming out, I hope more countries will do that for for adoptees as well, quite honestly. Yeah, that was one question I had, and I'm not sure. I mean, you're both you are an American adoptee from Korea, but you also live in the Netherlands, which has a really active part in prompting the Korean government to investigate their past adoptions. I'm wondering if you're involved in that at all. Um, yeah, and the- where are you coming from with that, whether it's from the Dutch side or from the U.S. side? Yeah, the TRC that's initiated by uh, DKRG in, uh, in uh, Denmark, or Norway, sorry, Norway. And um, yeah, no, the, the Dutch are also involved. And so I'm a part of their organization, which is the NLKRG, mm-hmm. uh, the Dutch Korean Rights Group. And uh, Norway obviously initiated it with uh, Peter Muller and uh, Boon Young. And from what I understand, at least my case was uh, taken up in the original 34, I believe it was, um, that initiated the whole process. And then after that, they've been able to prove enough to allow even more uh, files and cases uh, in the in the investigation. And they've also been able to extend it even for another year. But yeah, I mean, it was just initially wanting to obviously support that because it's one of the first, you know, I mean, I'm, there's, uh, what is it? Not Haiti, but, Haiti, but um, is it Sri Lanka? I think they also started their own investigation right. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, Korea, obviously they have one of the longest histories of adopted adoption. And yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what in the end, what the findings are. And I know at least with Peter and because of his you know legal background as well, that I think helps a lot. And because he's a man, I mean, that's just just the patriarchal society in Korea as well. Uh, that, that I think that that makes an influence as well in order to be able to get this, uh, yeah, progressing and hopefully it'll result in something. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I really hope that it'll change some perspective in, in Korea as well um, and that they'll understand the reason why adoptees keep coming back and the reason why you know we're trying to have access to our files and, and get gain this right to identity and origin, as so many country you know inter country adoptees are trying to do. But it, it sounds and it seems like it's just like a you know a, a sound wall that just keeps reverberating back again because there's not a single country yet that is completely truly opened up for inter-country adoptees to be like yes this is a right you own and giving full access and giving us also on equal terms you know and I think that was what was different like with my lawsuit because it was you know otherwise he would have never had to have any contact with me he would have been protected if the adoption agency would have contacted him and said you know your daughter's searching for you uh you know can she contact you and he said no then it would be finished right and then through this paternity suit it was a completely different route but it allowed me to gain that access without having to have someone give me you know permission from an adoption agency and that's the most infuriating thing i think for adoptees is that they constantly have to beg and plead with people to you know give them this innate right where doing it through the court system it was just very black and white for the court then it was like okay you have all of this evidence um yeah he has to do this test yes he's your father so you know of course they can't tell him he had to meet me or anything but I at least had the access. I could gain, you know, medical records. I could, you know, gain information to to who he was. And I would have never had that if it was up to the adoption agency and the privacy laws that protect biological parents. Yeah, that's such a universal thing with adopted people. Is that and you also internalize it as well, where you think that you aren't entitled to it because why would you be if it's so hard to get? Yeah. And then yeah, so you sort it, of give up. 
Yeah. Exactly, because you keep getting no's, and all of those no's are also, and, and then, you know, and I, I mean, I even got, you know, uh, a lot of um, cri uh, criticism from other adoptees because, like, I wasn't respecting the culture, I wasn't respecting this, I wasn't, you know, giving, I should be more low key, I shouldn't be forcing my way into things, you know, and doing it like an American. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> but I thought, you know, but none of those other, other, ways work you know there's not one way to roam as they say and none of the other paths worked I mean I was just continually denied and I said when do we you know when do we just keep allowing that to happen and if and I still have no regrets because if I wouldn't have forged forward I would to this day not know that he's my father because he's passed away like six months after I met him he died so like I would have never known if I wouldn't have pushed forward so these are, you know, these are things, and that's the point too, is most of us adoptees are getting older and our parents are also getting obviously older and we're losing the, the time and the chance to be able to have any access to them. And, you know, privacy laws and, and agencies are, are in our way. And then I assume on top of that is the same thing we have here in the U.S. for the domestic adoptees is this, um, it's a patriarchal culture, but also the shame that was um, put upon mothers who weren't married. Yes. And that's still an yeah. issue in Korea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm going there the end of this month, actually, again. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to have like one last chance to maybe say something to her on um, television, if she's even alive. Of course, that we don't know as well. But yeah, I mean, that's what I constantly, you know, tried to say, like, don't be ashamed. Like, and especially now that he's passed away, then I think like you know, what else, you know, you have nothing to lose now, even if it's in secret, you know, like, I don't need to meet her in public or anything. And that's what I've continually said, like, even if it's in secret, that you at least can meet and know your story. And, um, I mean, it's, it's a shame that that even has to be part of the something we have to say. Uh, but it's, it is what it is. So, yeah. It sounds very familiar. I was going to ask you if you ever had a relationship with your father, but it sounds like you either didn't have the time or didn't want to have a relationship. Yeah, I, I honestly, I have no idea because after that, the family just basically told me like he doesn't want contact with you. It was never from his mouth and himself. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the like seven minutes that I spent in the same room with him where, you know, I, I could say anything to him. Uh, he wasn't really open or willing to uh, to really have a relationship, let's say. <laughs> but that's understandable under the circumstances that we came together, right? Like, I didn't want any of that. Like, I wanted to just meet in, like, a one-on-one -on -one space together and just talk and then and then let it be done. But, that, yeah, that wasn't allowed. So that's I, what came. I hadn't realized that you had appeared. You must have both appeared in court at the same time, and you had these seven minutes. No, he didn't appear uh, at court at all. They, he didn't have to. Uh, his lawyer didn't also even show up. Um, no, he met me at my lawyer's office like the Monday after the trial, where it was confirmed for sure that, you know, that the judge said he has to recognize me. And then he came to my lawyer's office and it was supposed to be just him and I, we were supposed to meet. And then he showed up with uh, bodyguards and he had like complete facial covering. And he stayed for like five minutes at the my lawyer's office and uh, she was kind of translating and but he like denied everything and acted like he didn't know what he was even doing there which could be true I don't know um, because he thought he went for just like a health checkup he didn't think that he went for a paternity test the family said they didn't even tell him that any of this happened until like that day of the trial like when it was pronounced that I was his daughter um, so he only had basically two days before he met me in order to process everything so I don't know. I have no idea. Like, I wish I could have been obviously a fly in the wall to, to hear how those conversations went and what they said to him, because, you know, obviously how you approach someone at that age, he was 85, you know, and how you approach someone at that age in a patriarchal uh, culture where he was kind of really the man in the family in his whole life, I think, because he was very wealthy and uh, with status. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it could have gone differently. I, I, I could only presume, right? Because it's all right. about context and how you word things and how you talk to somebody. But um, they chose to do it this way. And I mean, I understand as well, because I was this outsider who, you know, pushed a lawsuit on them in the end. And uh, yeah, they didn't expect that to happen. They thought I would just go away, but I didn't. I just can't imagine having to deal with all the secrecy, all the shame that goes along with wanting to know 
your full identity and then your father shows up in a in a mask yeah he had like the mask and sunglasses and a hat it was completely unrecognizable and then he had like these two beefy like body carts with him and they like scanned the room like everything it was like a movie oh my god that's <laughs> yeah crazy. i mean i can laugh about it now no i know I, was, I can laugh at it too like, because probably you know like i get some privileges being of an adoptee and i can imagine it but yeah. not an inter-country adoptee yeah 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 exactly no i mean that was like the the I could never imagine that, you know, that would happen. They basically called my lawyer, like, right before he arrived. They said, we're in the basement. And the only way he's coming up is if he has these two bodyguards with him uh, in the parking garage in the basement. And uh, and if you don't agree, then he's, he's leaving. But I was like, you know, this is like my chance to meet him, chance to ask him who my mother is. This is it. You know, I can't back down and say no now. And um, she was furious, though. She was just like, what? Do you think we have knives? What do you, what do you think we're going to do to him? <laughs> like right. yeah. <laughs> we're two small korean women <laughs> but uh yeah no it um that was pretty ugly yeah but that's the, but that's what propelled me obviously even more so to feel this kind of you know empowerment after the fact that i had her because you are completely powerless right and especially with adoptees without citizenship as well i mean everything is constantly just being predetermined for you and you have no power over your situation and you never did and so this was like the moment that I gained that power back over my life as an adult. And then gaining my citizenship was the moment that I regained power and took back what was lost from that four-year-old girl who uh, was abandoned. I love ending it on that. I think that's such a perfect thing to, to end with. So Kara, yeah. thanks so much for talking with us. If, if someone was interested in gaining Korean citizenship, uh, is there a place or a good resource available? that you would recommend? Yeah, that's the difficult thing is because every single state even in America is different and every country is different and how they do it. So the only thing you can do is basically, you know, reach out into the adopting networks in your community and where you live and see if anyone else has gone through the process and obviously speak to the consulate or embassy that's closest to you. Um, that's really the only advice I can give because anything I've done is not going to be the same as for, you know, whoever is in America who might be watching or anywhere else in the world. Um, the Netherlands is even different than Belgium, which is like literally just a few hours away. Um, and I hear in different states in America, it's the same. Like they give you the runaround and it's very unclear. And some of the states don't even know how to do it sometimes. If it's not like a big, bigger consulate or embassy. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know uh, for adoptees what to do because it's kind of like this, you know, unwritten rule that that's just kind of, you know, been passed down from up high, but then not really thought through uh, <laughs> and how to how to actually process it. The same with my verdict, right, with becoming my father's daughter. Like, that's why it took so long to be taken up into his registry because they're like, this has never happened before. We don't know how to we don't know how to call her. We don't know what to write in his registry. So, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's that's difficult. Yeah, I think it's, the lesson here is to persevere. Yeah. Yeah. And be denied yeah. so it makes you angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What Next is a production of Adoptees United, Inc., a national nonprofit organization dedicated to equality for all adopted people. It is produced and hosted by me, Gregory Luce. Check out our past episodes and subscribe to any future episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, any donations to Adoptees United are tax deductible. So consider supporting this work by donating to Adoptees United at adopteesunited.org donate. See you next time.